Good plan. So there are three um, three pieces that Lightning combines to achieve its beautiful properties, which are multi signatures, hash locks, and time locks. So multi signature is just uh, what it says it is. Uh, it allows multiple parties to cooperate to spend some coins. And uh, a script may require um, some m some m number of signatures out of possible n signatures. So we can set up schemes like two out of three multi sig when two keys are stored at different locations and the third key is stored at some trusted party and this trusted party cannot spend the coins by its own but if I lose one of my keys I can go to this party and the party helps me recover my bitcoins this is one possible application of multisig um, hash locks allow outputs to be constrained by the knowledge of some secret value so the output would contain uh, some uh, hash value and the one who wants to spend the coins must provide the input that hashes to this predetermined value. So knowledge of some secret allows, allows me to spend the coins. And finally, time blocks uh, determine some point in time, some point in the future, where the transaction becomes valid. And before this point in time, it cannot be included in a block. So we can broadcast it, of course, but the nodes just want, uh, the miners want mine because it's not valid. And time blocks can be defined as, um, as relative or as absolute. The absolute time blocks are just in the number of blocks or in timestamp. And relative, uh, relative blocks are defined in terms of the time uh, which passed since the block where the transaction is mined. So um, if Alice sends some coins to Bob with a time lock, it says, okay, Bob, here are your coins, but you can only spend it uh, 100 blocks after this transaction is mined. And Bob has to wait 100 blocks. Uh, and now it's whiteboard time. Yeah. Can you do the other one? Yeah. So, um, thanks a lot for the whiteboard, because I found it very useful to explain things with, with the whiteboard instead of trying to put it on the slides. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to explain a couple of earlier attempts at creating payment channels, show how they are not kind of perfect, and then show how Lightning actually solve these problems. So the first ideas of the payment channel, they date back to Satoshi. I think he wrote on some forums that we can basically exchange transactions without actually putting them onto the, onto the actual blockchain. And the first uh, kind of idea is the unidirectional payment channel which basically says something like that. So imagine we have Alice and Bob, and initially, um, so they create a transaction which says, um, uh, that 99 coins go to Alice, and one coin goes to Bob. So this is, um, so this is some Alice's output, the Alice creates this transaction, and she sends it to Bob. And Bob, if he wants, he can put it on the blockchain, and it will get confirmed, everything's fine, uh, but he doesn't do it yet, because he's waiting for Alice to send him the next one. So Alice creates the next transaction, and she spends the same output, creates a new transaction, and in this new transaction, it says 98 coins go to Alice, and two coins go to Bob. Of course, from the point of view of the blockchain, this is a uh, typical double spend, and it won't get confirmed if both of them hit the blockchain, but we don't yet put them on the blockchain. And then Alice continues to sign new and new transactions, which give um, fewer coins to herself and more coins to Bob. At some point in time, Bob says, uh, or Alice says, uh, okay, that's enough, we want to cancel this, uh, like, to stop this relationship, and then the last transaction is being broadcast onto the blockchain. And the reason why it's the last transaction that's broadcast is just because the Bob, uh, because Bob, um, uh, because all these transactions are stored at Bob's uh, computer, and Bob can decide whether to broadcast them or not. And uh, the last transaction gives him the most money. And uh, yeah. Alice can also broadcast. She could send them to the chain. Yeah, mm. that would then be maybe the other transaction that gets broadcast. Mm, that's a good question. Isn't that the main problem of this system? That you're about to get? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's the main problem. That's the, that's the, that's the reason why, why it only works one way. It only works okay. in, uh, in, in, in one direction. Uh, and um, yeah, this is kind of problem, problem number one. Um, I should look it up, by the way. I mean, I understand the question, but I don't have a ready answer back there, so... Okay, <laughs> sorry for interrupting. Yeah, Alice could be motivated to, to do yeah. this whole thing. Yeah. Bob gives her the physical goods that 
she's buying, and then she transmits her first transaction to the chain. Yeah, yeah. Well, probably, probably I just don't know the answer. Discount. And and probably this is just a very basic construction which doesn't protect from it. Right. And in order partially to protect from it, uh, another construction was proposed, which is based on uh, time loss. So in the time loss construction, um, the same kind of the same idea about a series of consequent transactions is used, but these transactions are also um, use the time loss. So if we imagine some kind of timeline, then um, the first transaction that gives, say, 99 points to Alice and 1 points to Bob has a time log, which is somewhere over here, is time zero. And starting from time zero, the, the initial transaction becomes valid. So it can be put on the blockchain starting from here into infinity. But then when they want to update their balance, uh, they create another transaction at some, uh, with, with a time log that becomes valid after some point in time t1. And the crucial thing is that it must be, er, it must be closer to the present than t0. And so this is when the second transaction becomes valid. And so on. And the next transaction becomes valid with this, uh, after, after this point in time. And the um, motivation behind this is that the latest transaction, the latest state, can be confirmed on the blockchain before any other state can get confirmed. So even if some of the parties is trying to cheat and tries to broadcast some, some older state, which is one of these states, the other party can broadcast the actual latest state, and it will get confirmed earlier, and therefore all the subsequent uh, transactions won't get confirmed. So this is uh, kind of better because it allows for bidirectional payments. Alice can pay Bob, Bob can pay Alice, and it doesn't matter because the time locks don't depend on who pays whom. Uh, but, of course, it has its limitations, its construction has limitations, because first of all, this initial time lock determines the whole lifetime of this payment channel. And uh, second, the number of transactions is also limited, because here, between any two points, we must have some security margin to allow for potential dispute to happen. Therefore, uh, by just dividing the time between, uh, between now and T0, by the security margin, we get the number of transactions that, it, that this channel can handle, and it's uh, it's definitely not infinite. Okay, so sorry, yeah. can I ask a question? Yeah. Are you saying that um, the time locks shorten the more transactions have been done in the channel, or? Yeah, yeah. In this construction, uh, this is not lightning yet, but in this earlier construction, uh, say. I don't know, the first transaction gets valid on, I don't know, 25th of December. This one is valid on 24th of December. This one is valid on 23rd of December, and so on. So if someone tries to put this transaction onto the blockchain, and the time is before the 23rd, say, then I can put this transaction on the blockchain. It will get confirmed on the 23rd, and this one won't get confirmed at all. But how is this by the action? Uh, bidirectional in the sense that Alice can pay Bob and Bob can pay Alice. So these not, not the same coins. That yeah, each transaction pulls the time forward to the present, and whoever has the the receipt that's closest to today can submit it to the chain and get it approved. It will be validated. Could you repeat the last? But they part have both to allocate coins into yeah, the chain. Exactly. Pardon? They, they, they both have to allocate coins into. Yes, the as nine nine and one or whatever. When everyone has to spend what he personally has that. Also, the, right. the one is not a is not a change. Uh, no, no, this uh, this is okay. a change. It is, it. This goes to Alice and this goes to yeah. Bob. They <laughs> distribute the same uh, set of coins. Uh, yeah. So these were kind of earlier attempts, and we can. Yeah. Yep. For practical terms, what would you consider a good security margin like the time? Um, I think it. The, Depends on the fee that you're ready to pay, but I think it should definitely be like on the order of hours. Uh, I mean, m multiple blocks. It, sh it shouldn't be like 20 minutes because it may be the case that no blocks are produced within 20 minutes at all. Uh, so, <coughs> who dictates the time? So, who, who, who makes the, the decision what time we have now? Uh, because of time based attacks could happen. I think it's. Some 
I mean, but it's block it's number. Time or block, block it's number? It's block number that determines what okay. time you're at. No, I mean, which part? It, the question was, that I think, which part it determines it. And I think... Um, Whoever sends the first transaction and decides T0, right? I mean, T0, yes. Um, yeah, the question about who decides on the time intervals, and that's like just based on two parties. So it's like just yeah. between if, yeah, they want to have like sub, you know, ten minute things where they can do that, although it doesn't make sense. Absolutely. But, yeah. yeah, I think that's a question of negotiation between the parties as they spend some kind of common common yeah. pool protocol. If you customers. were to implement this protocol, you could say that when you open the channel, you have to set it to zero. But we're not talking about a real implementation. But it has to be at least ten minutes because if you submit conflicting transactions in the same block. Well, it would have to be, I would say, much more human scale because yeah. you have well, to have for time security. To I would do at least six blocks, but even theoretically, more, I would do one block. In some cases, like days, because if it's for purchase of physical goods, mm. you need shipping time as your security margin. You know, so it has to be flexible. Mm. Yeah. So uh, yeah, basically, in any case, this is still not lightning. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is also this is only an illustration to demonstrate the key the key problem with second layer protocols, which is yeah. how to define the latest state. So the parties here have some kind of internal state that they maintain through the off chain protocol, but they want to use the security guarantees for from the layer one. So they have to explain to the layer one somehow which state is the latest. But the layer one doesn't know anything about this internal protocol because we that's the whole point, we want to pull it off the, off the chain. So the question becomes, um, in this sequence of, of, um, of states, uh, how, to, um, how does the latest state, the valid state, differ from all the previous states? So here it's basically no different. Here it's different by the time log. And Lightning invents some other clever construction which makes it different in another way, which makes it arguably more useful for action applications. We forgot to the brakes on. It's called the dynamic, dynamic, dynamic black uh, whiteboard. <laughs> no brakes. Does it have brakes? It does, yeah. Yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. by revocation. And the general mechanics is that Alice and Bob, when they are updating to the new state, they exchange some secret information that lets them punish each other in, in case then the other party cheats. So uh, Alice says to Bob, okay, uh, here's the secret key. In case I will try to cheat you, you will be able to take all my money. So this is the key. And the Bob says to Alice, if I try to cheat, then you can use this key and you'll be able to take all my money. And then they update to the next state. And in, in this scenario, they're both sure that um, with certain security assumptions, uh, they are not incentivized to cheat, otherwise they will lose uh, the money in the channel. And this dispute is, uh, of course, there's some window uh, for this dispute to be raised, but within this time frame, if the other party, if the victim complains to the layer one, then the layer one will be able actually to uh, determine who who is the cheater here? And uh, now I'm going to explain how exactly it's implemented in transactions. So the protocol starts from the step where yeah, the protocol starts with the channel opening, which means that Alice and Bob put some coins into a multi-signature address, and uh, this is called the funding transaction. So they had some like inputs, doesn't matter, but here's the funding transaction. Um, which assigns some coin to some coins to Alice and some coins to Bob. And now the kind of interesting part is that they don't just sign a single transaction, but they sign two different transactions. And one transaction goes to Alice, another transaction goes to Bob. So they reflect the same distribution of funds, but they are symmetrical. And uh, Alice has Alice's version and Bob has Bob's version. So let me. 
So here's the funding transaction. The funding transaction has a multi-signature output, which means that this thing can be spent only if, Bob, uh, if both Alice and Bob sign this transaction. And the first step, they create a, a pair of transactions. So this is one transaction, this is another transaction. Um, so the upper part is what Alice stores in her computer. Here's what Bob stores. So what does the Alice's transaction say? The Alice's transaction says the following. So it has two outputs. And one output assigns 99 coins to Alice. And the second assigns one coin to Bob. And here, in the Bob's version, we have the same thing. 99 to Alice and one to Bob. But with a hint. So the Alice's version says 99 coins go to Alice, but only after some time t. And one coin goes to Bob immediately. And the Bob version says that 99 coins go to Alice immediately, but one coin goes to Bob after time t. So um, this is still not the end, but at least in this version, what is different between this transaction is that in the end, both parties will get the same distribution. But if Alice, Alice broadcasts her transaction, then she will have to wait until this time, till she can actually spend this output and claim her money. So she has to wait. And if Bob broadcasts his version of this transaction, then he has to wait, and Alice can get her coins instantly. So then the interesting part come, comes here. Uh, in addition to this condition, this output can be claimed by Alice after time t, or it can be claimed by Bob, surprisingly enough, if Bob knows some secret S. And symmetrically, in this scenario, coin, this coin goes to Bob after t, or it goes to Alice if Alice knows the secret. And this is um, exactly that secret that uh, I was talking about at the previous slide, um, that will let this construction update to the next state securely. So this, this has all been kind of a setup phase, and I'm going to explain how we transition to the next, in the next state, the next update. So is it uh, clear so far? So now we want to transition to the next update, and Alice wants to send 1.12. So another pair of transactions is signed. These transactions again spend the same output. So this new transaction says 98 goes to Alice, uh, say after T. So none of these transactions are broadcast to chain. Uh, yes, yes. This is all happening off chain for now. Except the funding transaction. Right. Except the funding. This is on the blockchain, and this is actual our origin. Output mm -hmm. on the blockchain. To go to Bob. Are, are these consecutive transactions? Like uh, they continue to do business with one another, and yes. then there was a first exchange, and then a second business instance with a second uh, payment set. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, did they get it? Yes. The answer okay. is yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do we transition to the next state? So in the next phase, both parties sign a new pair of transactions, but during this protocol, they exchange these secret values. I should probably So S1, S2. No, I, I just want to show that this is like Bob actually knows this S now, and Alice actually knows this S. Yeah, we can we do the second transaction. Second. Yeah, yeah, we can. Uh, zero. So they get S X minus one in transaction S X. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. S Alice zero. Yeah. To be even more precise, these are of course different kind of numbers. Yeah. So now they are in this space, and they like Alice holds this transaction and this transaction. Bob holds this transaction and this transaction. Everything is off-chain. And now, 
Alice can choose what she wants to put on the blockchain. Of course, if she wants to continue the operation, she just does nothing, and they update to the next state, the next state, and so on. But then, imagine if Alice wants to cheat. So Alice could try to claim 99 coins, while in fact they agreed already on 98 coins. So if Alice puts this onto the blockchain, it will get confirmed, of course. But this output that Alice wants to claim, she would be able to claim only after this time. But Bob, because he knows the secret which Alice gave to him, would be able to claim the same 99 coins earlier. So if Bob has been monitoring the blockchain and notices this attempt to steal his money, he says, wait a minute, um, or I don't know what he says, he may say, thank you for 99 coins, uh, and create a new transaction, and just spend these coins with the secret. And after time t, Alice will be able to do nothing because everything is already spent. I didn't interrupt. So 98 is um, the cumulative state of multiple transactions. It's not a correction of the first 99. Um, mm, didn't, didn't quite get it. So um, you say like um, they agree on 98 uh, to Alice and 2 to Bob. Yeah, this that, is, is, that, that is the consequence of uh, cum, uh, cum, uh, multiple transactions. Oh, okay, this is a single, like, this is an atomic transaction in life. So this, this is a scenario where Alice simply wants to send one coin to Bob. And uh, in the peer-to-peer -peer protocol, she says some kind of message, okay, now I want to send you this coin, here is, like, here is this new transaction, give me that secret, here is my secret, and they exchange it. I'm confused by just very yeah, minor yeah. technical details. Your timestamps T must probably be different in the different Yeah, yeah, this, this is a simplification. And also, the secrets must be different. Okay. Yes, yes, yeah, the secrets okay. are different, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the times actually these time these timestamps are they good. must be ordered. <laughs> yeah, they are relative to the blocks where a particular transaction is confirmed. So if say Alice tries to cheat and actually puts this onto the blockchain and then gets confirmed in the block number 600,000 and this T actually says like plus 100 so this would be valid after 600,100 and, um, and the secrets change with every transaction yeah, and the secrets change with every transaction mm -hmm. and you have a separate protocol for distributing the secrets to the other part here, the hash of the secret uh, yeah, I mean it's, it's just, I mean, from the Networking point of view, Lightning is just another peer-to-peer -peer network, and the uh, uh, nodes connect to each other, they exchange messages, they exchange gossip messages about who opened which channel, so that the nodes can uh, have a view of the network. Uh, so they, they also, like part of the protocol, they send each other these secrets and um, transactions and so on. And you said there is an assumption that every party is monitoring the blockchain for broadcasted transactions to catch someone cheating. Yeah. So you must be able to run it on the full scale. Blockchain. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. That's one of the kind of one of the drawbacks or one of the shortcomings of Lightning that uh, parties must be able. They don't have to be like constantly online every second, but at least they have to check uh, at least once within this interval. So if this transaction has appeared, so within time t, I should be able to check it and have enough time to put to put my, my transaction onto the blockchain. Does this mean that every party must have the full state of the blockchain local? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, um, you don't have to store it. You can just uh, use some something like, like a proof, like a proof no, Like, of course, you can outsource it to a server if you trust the server. If you don't want to trust anyone, you can run a Bitcoin node. But you don't have to store all the blocks. You can just uh, process incoming transactions because you know what like. You know this, uh, what Alice stores, and you. Um, okay. Yeah, and not exactly that, by the way. Uh, this is why, like a technical detail again, but why segregated witness was important for Lightning. Be before this update in 2017, it was impossible to predict which, uh, what would be the hash of the transaction before, like, or it, would, it was possible to modify the transaction in such a way that the semantics remained the same, but the hash was different. And therefore, it was impossible because. Uh, if I'm monitoring the blockchain, I don't know what to look for. Just hashes pass by, that, and I should, like, what should I do? But after segment was implemented, it would it became possible to create a transaction which depends on the transaction which is not yet on the blockchain. 
So actually, Bob has already, in his inter internal computer, he already has a transaction which spans from here. He just do doesn't, doesn't broadcast it, but it's already, already there, so I know it's not. The same thing with that. Could you give, I think, a real-world example for uh, that justifies uh, the transition from uh, the first situation, 99 and 1, to 99, 98 and 2? Yeah, just a, a simple, like, I, um, like the, the, most, the, the, the more pure example would be with the initial balances of 100 and 0, but it kind of looks a bit stupid to create an output which sends 0 points to someone. But what, in, in fact, what happens in real Lightning is that one party opens the channel. So in this case, Alice, for example, wants to connect to Lightning. She has 100 coins. She establishes the channel with some uh, Lightning hub or with some random node. And they establish a channel, and initially Alice has all the coins, and that node on the remote end and doesn't have any coins. And then Alice starts paying with Lightning, either to this node or to someone else via multipath payments, which I'm going to explain uh, in the future. Uh, so she just spends her coins. So, so Alice wants to, to, to pay one Bitcoin to Bob. Alice buys a bicycle from Bob. Yeah. 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 Um, Nice. The, the second uh, stage, 98 to 2, what happens between 99 to 1 and 98 to 2? That's actually the transaction. So Alice, Alice now, now has one coin less, and Bob now has one coin more. Mm -hmm. So essentially, one coin moved from Alice to Bob. That's that's a transaction. Mm -hmm. But I think you buy just gear from Zap, so you buy one gear, and rather than sending the transaction from there, right? He's just waiting. So I can open the card. Yeah, it's just. It's Current cumulative exactly. transactions. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's not a correction of the first state. Well, so you have well, well, every, every new transaction yeah. 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 invalidates the it's old one. It's not like they're the sequential, they don't eventually be netted out. So the yeah. Yeah. each new one makes the other one invalid. Okay, got it. Yeah. The difference between T's. Okay, I mean, here actually the, the T's are the same because they are relative, but they are important. I mean, they are the same, but they are important, yes. Yes. Otherwise, hours could cheat, get yeah. the bicycle, and then spend the transaction before yeah. in order yeah. to not pay for the bicycle. Yeah. If if t is too short, yeah. then it means that Bob has less time to dispute, and that yeah. means that with high probability Alice can can cheat. take his yeah. money. But but the other, on the other hand, if we increase this t um, a lot, that would mean that when parties close the channel, for example, in this state. They, they are very cooperative and so on, and Alice has to wait for this time t until her money are unlocked. So, okay, uh, yeah, by the way, this is not uh, kind of precisely the case that I described. So let me explain how the, the parties close the channel. And there are three ways, as mentioned on the slides, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good way is that when parties are cooperative and online, and Alice just sends a message to Bob, hey Bob, I want to close the channel, and Bob says, okay, let's close the channel. And they just create a common transaction, just without any time loss or, or whatever, which says 98 goes to Alice and two coins go to Bob. And they just put it on the blockchain and their cooperative everything is, is fine. That's the two of two multi -state. Yeah, yeah, they just co-sign and without any further restrictions they can spend their coins. So a little bit less, um, a little bit less, uh, like the best scenario in this, in this um, terminology is when Alice wants to close the channel, but Bob is offline, Bob doesn't respond to any messages. In that case, Alice just broadcasts the last transaction that she has, this transaction, and yes, she has to wait until time t, till she can actually use her coins. But that's kind of unfortunate, but her coins are not in danger, no one can steal them, because no one has the secret, the secret hasn't been exchanged. And uh, she just waits, and then she takes her money. And Bob can take his money whenever he goes online or whatever he wants. And the third way, uh, like we basically already discussed the third way, when one party tries to cheat, then another party publishes this punishment transaction, which takes the money with this scenario, with secret number, rather than this. Okay. Yes. Just one question. When exactly the secret is being exchanged? Uh, right. I mean, I mean uh, did I understand the question correctly? Like, if yeah, all, all I was, was wondering whether you would have an incentive to actually engage in a channel with somebody who funds the channel and then you try to scam them by essentially dosing them, so preventing them from getting <laughs> online, and then you can play the entire channel. 
Yeah, maybe it's possible. But if, you don't, if you don't know the secret, you can't do that. If you only get the secret once you update the state. I would then, think the protocol exchanges the secret as the last message once. Yeah, it well, it has to write, obviously. Yeah. yeah, otherwise there's an incentive to cheat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. both of these are funding transactions. Even if you DDoS them straight after that, they're not going to lose any more than they already committed. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a good question. I don't know. Like, I, I didn't go that much into the specification of the protocol to understand what exactly is the order of these messages. But uh, it should be some order that probably depends on who pays whom in this particular transaction. Uh, but yeah, as as the sum of this protocol, they exchange the messages and they send it. Okay. So now the interesting part is the multi-path payments. So of course, users cannot connect to all other users. Otherwise, it won't scale. And the ideal scenario is when people can use paths of channels to rebalance them in this way, so that Alice pays to Carol, she rebalances her channel with Bob, and Bob rebalances the channel with Carol. And of course, the key requirement here is atomicity, which means that either two channels update or none of them update, because the scenario where Bob can run away with the money is very bad, and the scenario where Bob, on the other hand, uh, loses the money, like Carol pulls money from Bob, but Bob cannot pull from Alice, it's also very bad. So we want to ensure atomicity. And the way we do that is with a common secret. Yeah, here I should say a big thanks to uh, Peter Rizzo for this beautiful illustration, this is not my work. And I um, shamelessly stole them from his blog post, and the blog post is very critical of Lightning, and uh, like, <laughs> explains why, why Lightning cannot work, but the illustrations are very nice. And I <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we ensure atomicity with a common secret uh, by doing the following. So, first of all, Carol wants to get paid by Alice, and Carol creates a random secret number within her computer, and she hashes it, and she sends the hash of her secret to Alice. Uh, here is called password for some reason. Uh, so Carol says, okay, the hash is 45F8, please pay to this, to this hash. And Alice creates... Um, a new, um, it is called hashtag not contract, but like it's terminology. Basically, Alice says to Bob, okay, you will get this coin if you provide a number that hashes to 45F8. Otherwise, if you don't do it within 48 hours, then I take the coin back. So basically, this is just an extension of, of this mechanism, uh, but also with hash locks. So we have time locks, as, as I described previously, we have the secrets, but also we have the additional constraint with these hash locks. Uh, what happens then? Yeah, okay, Bob obviously doesn't know the secret. But Alice tells Bob, okay, Carol may know the secret, so you should ask Carol. Then Bob creates a similar contract with Carol, saying, okay, um, I will give you this coin if you give me the secret, which hashes to 45.8. If you don't do it in 44 hours, then I take the coin back. Carol wants to get paid, therefore she reveals her secret to Bob, and the coin goes to Carol. Then Bob Notice that there is a difference between the time of times 48 hours and 44 hours. So Bob actually, even in the worst case, when Carol is very late to disclose the secret, Bob still has four hours to claim the coin from Alice by using the same secret that he got from Carol to open that lock, and the coins, uh, the coin goes from Alice to Bob. And this is what we have now. <laughs> So basically, this is the map, this is the geographical depiction of the current Lightning network, and each of those lines are actual channels established with this protocol, and each of these channels uh, can be used to transfer money using the common common hash in multi multi hop payments from uh, Europe to Japan to Australia to the US to whatever, and it looks uh, beautiful. I like it a lot. Do you? <laughs> How did they geolocate? Uh, and that's a very good question. Actually, the Lightning Protocol is using the IP addresses and it doesn't try to hide anything. So I think it's possible to run over Tor, but it's not very popular. Uh, so basically, they geolocate it by IP address. It's a very tricky question in regards to privacy because Lightning Protocol basically um, puts together your identifier in the Lightning Protocol and your IP address. So when I connect to node, I say to my node, okay, connect to um, this node ID at this IP address. So 
this may be kind of not very good for practice. How are those maintained? If I am on a dynamic IP that changes who rotates? Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, probably I won't be able to connect to you. Just the same as with Bitcoin nodes, you have to have external IP so that I can connect to you. But of course you can connect to whoever provides an external IP right. to connect to. Yeah, so are there any yeah. limits uh, how much participants can join the channel? Uh, so a single channel is by definition a two-party uh, protocol, mm -hmm. so only two parties. But in, in, in terms of combination, like, there is no limitation as far as I remember how many channels one node can open. It's only up to you how, like, how you manage your node. Maybe there is some kind of technical limit which is very high. Basically you can open many nodes and connect to many channels and uh, things on. Yeah. Uh, when you decide for the not nice scenario that someone was cheating and you want to stop it, then you basically crash all the other transactions that happened also before in your channel, or they survive and you just like, roll back the last transaction. Mm -hmm. You mean like if someone tries to cheat? Yes, uh, uh, especially with this, with this forwarding, uh, this multipath. Mm -hmm. If you forward for five different people and one of them turns out to cheat, mm -hmm. do the others also get affected? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I and mean, then there are two parts in this. First, like in, if we only look at the single channel, yeah. then in the case of uh, cheating attempt, then the only way out is to close everything. So we stop our communication and we close the channel. So the, let's say you did three transactions, yeah. and on transactions three, you find out okay, I was cheated. I'd like to stop. Transactions one and two remain, like the first two coins can still be transferred and just the third will not be transferred? Mm, none of them are on chain yet. No, no, I mean... Oh, you committed it uh, first no. when opening. No, 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 this, no this is... This is ah, okay, good, so... Nothing is sent to chain until you want to close the channel. Ah, okay. Yeah, so the only thing that is... Um, not, the only thing that is actually on chain is like this funding transaction, yes. uh, this output, and the transaction that closes the channel. Rather, it can be cooperative close, it can be like non-cooperative close, or it can be cheating attempt and punishment. Ah, okay. So in the in the like the good and the bad cases on the two transactions allocate the blockchain per channel, and in the ugly case we have three transactions: this one, this one, and that one. What percentage of the closing transactions by now are hostile? Uh, I think it's rather small amount. I I didn't look at the data myself, but I think somewhere on uh, crypto Twitter, someone did these calculations, and it's not it's not very common, but but it happened. Uh, I think only in like experiments. Yeah, but also this is not the end of the slides. I also have a couple of points to make. Uh, pros and cons of lightning. Can I ask a quick yeah. question? So can we say that the difference between um, um, the Bitcoin blockchain? And the uh, payment channel is that payment channel uses balances. Um, I mean, in some sense, yes. I mean, the balance is kind of an abstraction that you can establish based on this protocol. So, under the hood, these are still Bitcoin transactions with UTXOs. Okay. But uh, using these UTXOs as building blocks, you actually establish establish balances. Yeah. So it's kind of different levels of abstraction. Okay. So pros and cons in Lightning, and uh, I definitely have more cons than pros here, but the pro is very, very important, actually, <laughs> I like it. Uh, Lightning is a way to transact very quickly with actual real Bitcoins. So contrary to some misconceptions, like Lightning is not an altcoin, Lightning is not some kind of trust-based uh, trust lines or credit lines or whatever. These are actual, like all of these are actual Bitcoin transactions which can be put on actual Bitcoin blockchain and confirmed. So we now have, if we establish the channel, if we go through all this kind of preparatory process, we can transfer Bitcoins very fast and with a very high precision. So the Lightning Protocol even operates on a scale of millisatoshi. So one satoshi is the smallest unit in Bitcoin, but within the Lightning we can even transfer amounts smaller than that, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah. I think there are still some limitations in terms of how fast you can open channels if you want to transact with different parties, right? Once you have the channel, it's instant. But yes, opening the channel, you are still bound by the 27 transactions per second on the global blockchain, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and closing the channel also follows mm -hmm. this limitation. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, we have the Bitcoin blockchain, and Lightning is kind of an addition to that. So we still have them. If we want to, um, yeah, I think I know what you mean. You mean that we cannot open and close channels that quickly as well because we have this Bitcoin limitations, and that, that is definitely true. That is also a limitation. So uh, I should say that there are many, many like drawbacks and limitations that stem from our design requirement of keeping everything very like absolutely trustless and based on Bitcoin. So the liquidity is very tricky because uh, the coins cannot move from their channel. So if, as a user, I opened the chat, like I opened a bunch of channels and I have ten coins here, I have five coins here, and I have seven coins here, which means that in one transaction I can still send at most ten coins. I cannot send twelve. I cannot send twenty. I have this amount of money, but I cannot use it in one transaction. And the same uh, kind of, um, yeah, no, no multi-path payments yet, though it's being implemented. And uh, uh, just today a podcast came out uh, where uh, Rusty Russell and Stefan Libera, if you're familiar with those guys, discussed the um, first implementation of this multi-path multi, multi payments. Uh, but this is not yet implemented. Does it have a name? Uh, Does it have a name, the multi-path payments feature? Um, it, it, it used to be called A and B, Atomic Multipath Payments, okay. but in the like in what C Lightning team has implemented, they call it multi-part payments, not multi-path payments. Uh, I think it's a little bit different, but it's still not widely used. And uh, what does it mean, a multi-path payment? Is it multiple parts, or is uh, it through? The yeah, the thing is that in, in this scenario where I have this amount of coins, I can actually send, say, 12 coins yeah. by using uh, like 10 coins from here and 2 coins from here right. simultaneously combined. Yeah. Uh, because this is how the internet works, this is how IP packets uh, find their way through different routes. Uh, but here we must choose only one path to the destination and use it exclusively. Can you tell us about channel factories? Uh, I'm sure, <laughs> actually. I mean, I know that this concept exists, yeah. but I'm not uh, that familiar. So it's some kind of a concept to create channels or close and open new channels more effectively, right? Well, I understand it's a multi-party channel. You many parties is like six, eight, ten, and you can create channels amongst those of new parties open and close them without going back to chain. Mm -hmm. That was my understanding, but I... And I, I don't think I can add, add, add much to that yet. Yeah, I need to add more. Maybe we should let Sergey get to the end of his yeah. presentation. <laughs> yeah, let's get to the end of So, yeah. I should just notice that, yeah, online requirement, users must watch the chain, and if you don't want to watch the chain yourself, you can outsource this, but again, do you trust the, uh, the server that's watching the chain for you, or how do you incentivize, how do you make the service accountable, and so on. Uh, complex UX, uh, again, like if you open Lightning Wallet, you might say, okay, you have on-chain balance X, you have two channels, you have incoming balance, outgoing balance, you can send this amount, you can receive this amount. It's just hard to uh, to understand this, and of course, wallet developers make attempts to make it more easy, but of course, how do, how do you maintain this balance between showing the user actually what is happening in the, in the protocol, or abstracting it away and introducing some amount of trust, connecting to big nodes by default, all the kind of... Uh, drawbacks, um, security guarantees. So, Lightning skeptics uh, say sometimes that a Lightning can be dangerous because, uh, in this scenario, for example, uh, each party must have something at stake, and if the channel is nearly depleted in one direction, that kind of means that one of the parties can can cheat and just has nothing to lose, so to say. So, the threat of this kind of, this transaction says, "Oh, I'm going to take all your coins from the channel." But if I don't have any coins more in the channel. It doesn't scare me very much. And um, yeah, so we have a dust limit, we have the question of who pays the transaction fee for this transaction. And uh, if Alice tries to cheat, if Bob tries to dispute this cheating transaction, he may think, okay, I may win $10, but the fees are very high, I will pay $20 to get this transaction into the blockchain, so it's just not worth it. Uh, yeah, sure, a problem, but it's kind of universal because in the real economy we also like uh, don't go to court for every every cheating attempt. And if someone cheats us and steals, I don't know, ten euros, we can just say whatever. I mean, I won't go to court for this. Pay the lawyers and kind of. And of course, there are many interesting attempts. This is my primary area of research: how private is Lightning Network, how we can analyze the transactions, what can we derive from the open data or from the data that a node can collect, 
And it turns out that there is an interesting trade-off between um, an identity or a lack of identity and denial of service attacks. Because in permissionless networks, if you want to maintain this quality that anyone can join, that also means that the attacker can join and create a thousand nodes and overwhelm our network and do some bad stuff. But if you want to prevent it, does it mean that we have to introduce some kind of identity system? Who maintains this identity? Does it, uh, like, it's obviously a central point of failure and uh, potential censorship, uh, means of censorship, so we also want to avoid that. So how do we, how do we square the circle? How do we, um, how do we solve it? So many interesting challenges. Uh, and finally, I would say that will Lightning save Bitcoin? I don't know. Basically, I think of Lightning as just another way to transfer Bitcoin. So I have some coins, I can either go on-chain or I can establish a channel and go off-chain. These are the, the, the same coins, but I just move them with a different wallet. The, the big uh, question for me that I've been thinking about is that, okay, in my opinion, Lightning makes all the sense in the world technically, and there are many very smart, competent people working on it, and I, I think they do their job very well, and they will implement whatever they want to implement, but do, is it really economical? Because the cost of locked up capital is really high. So if you like, remember this Alice space to Bob, space to uh, Carol, if we want to transfer one Bitcoin from here to there, that means that we must have one Bitcoin in the first channel and one Bitcoin in the second channel. And these Bitcoins must be aligned to the right side of the channel. So the capital requirements are very high. And um, uh, what Lightning is actually good for, I'm not sure, because they say that Lightning is good for micropayments, and this is kind of the use case that was mentioned in the initial white paper that people will be paying for every second of internet bandwidth they consume, or pay for an article in an online media, uh, but this trustless nature of Lightning introduces so many trade-offs and so many challenges in UX that maybe for small amounts it just doesn't, it isn't worth it. Maybe you can just go custodial and trust the operator uh, it would be much more convenient, and if operator cheats, then whatever, I will lose 5 euros, I don't care that much. And for large transactions, uh, maybe it could be used for some kind of uh, exchanges, rebalancing their balances, and uh, very quickly swapping liquidity between each other, but again, if you want to transfer large amounts, then we stumble upon liquidity problems, and large amount of Coins can be transferred only through a few big hubs with large amounts of money. And if it's like, if we have the central point of failure, then again, they can center us. Doesn't make any sense at all. So, <laughs> Lightning is definitely not a silver bullet. I, I'm continuing working on it, I continue following it. It's an exciting space, but uh, we shouldn't expect it to save everything. Uh, but it's still worth discussing, worth uh, researching, and worth implementing. So, with that, I'm happy to answer your questions. For micro uh, transactions, there was a the big problem is the, the, uh, the transaction fees are the big problem uh, at the time. How can the Lightning increase the transaction fees? So in Lightning, Lightning has transaction fees, and in this multi hop payment scenario, actually Bob transfers to Carol a little bit less than he receives from Alice. So there are transaction fees, and it is assumed that Lightning will also maintain itself economically, just as layer one. But for the moment, there has been research about that, that Lightning is largely non-economical and the fees don't pay for anything. So there's um, a funny, a funny um, interview with an anonymous entity that maintains the nodes which count for 40% of the total capacity. And, and this person says that, okay, I earn like $20 a month for fees, <laughs> despite locking millions of dollars there. Uh, which is kind of ridiculous. So now it's mostly maintained by enthusiasts which don't even try to yes. uh, earn their living from this. Yeah, but eventually it will be operated with fees. And it's also interesting because unlike the layer one, we don't have the issuance, we don't have the inflation uh, and new coins and new blocks and so on. So everything must be paid uh, in transaction fees from day one. The way I, I see from a scalability back to the core of why we have the right um, if I'm Alice and Bob need to transact, if they don't do at least three transactions, it makes no sense to use Lightning at all because they need to open and close two transactions on chain. So only when they do three transactions amongst themselves do they actually save an on chain transaction. So, but it doesn't have to be between Alice and Bob. It can be Alice and Bob to the other parts of Lightning. 
Yes, yeah, clearly. But if you don't have that volume of transactions, it's not going to achieve its goal. Is that correct? Mm, yeah, then, but I mean, the Lightning proponents would say that you are not actually locking your coins, you're actually like putting your coins to a better use because after you establish one channel, then you can pay very quickly to all other nodes and you can go to this online shop and pay two dollars to that online shop and pay two cents and so on. So the utility that you get is arguably larger, but yeah, sure, you should expect to make at least three transactions, but not necessarily to that node, but with Lightning in general. But if I only have a channel, if Alice and Bob have a channel, and Alice wants to transact with Charlie, Alice then has to do that through Bob in the multi-part yeah. scenario, right? And Bob has to be online for that to work. Yeah. So there's a lot of limitations. If Alice wants to go shopping and buy stuff at all the different clothing stores up and down the street, she needs a lot of channels. No? Uh, that's kind of yes and no, because uh, if, if I connect to a professionally maintained hub, which, is, which doesn't sound very decentralized, but it's reliable, because, uh, I mean, some you know, big operators, they rent servers on Amazon or whatever, they are online all the time, and I can expect them at least to work. Right. But of course, I not kind of trust them completely, but I trust them for availability at least. So Lightning Pay Inc., Alice creates a channel with Lightning Pay Inc., all the merchants have a channel with Lightning Pay Inc., and then she can go shopping. Yeah. But then Lightning Pay Inc. can censor Alice's transactions and censorship resistance is one of the core features of Bitcoin. Yeah, in, in that case, Alice has to uh, kind of decide for herself and choose a trade-off. Either she chooses like maximum efficiency, then she just connects to the biggest hub and trusts this hub for availability, or she connects to multiple hubs, and even if, if they don't collude, or if at least one of them works, then she can use, use this, or she can like differentiate and connect to random small nodes, uh, which probably belong to some just regular people, but she uh, should expect that they may go offline any minute, and uh, this is may maybe a problem as well. So if I try to pay you with Lightning, there should be in the wallet that I'm using this implementation some kind of fallback, so that if I've tried through all these different hubs or channels to pay you and nothing works, ultimately we have to fall back to the chain and I just pay you on the chain, is that correct? Is that how you would see a, a, a robust implementation? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the scenarios. Uh, so, yeah, there is this kind of proposal. There, there are proposals uh, to encode the fallback Bitcoin address into the Lightning invoice. So, if I want you to pay me with Lightning, I send you an invoice, you parse it with the wallet, and it says, okay, uh, try to pay me with Lightning, but in case you cannot pay me, this is my, my on-chain uh, wallet. I'm not sure it's implemented already kind of in actual code, but it's kind of an obvious idea, or we can, if we are interacting anyway, uh, you can just tell me via email or something, I cannot pay with Lightning, can you send me the Bitcoin address? So, uh, we can always fall back. Uh, I have a question. So, let's suppose that in a couple of years or so, uh, Lightning becomes extremely successful, uh, and there are actually more transactions done on Lightning uh, instead of the layer one solution. Wouldn't be, wouldn't this be a problem because it would actually starve the miners and, and therefore reduce uh, the incentives that miners get and, and ultimately reduce this level of security of layer one? I mean, it's a reasonable concern, and the, an honest answer is I don't know, and probably nobody knows, because it's kind of a complex economic game that is very hard to predict. And I think this falls under the general category of concerns about should we, should we put some additional semantics onto the base protocols, like in Ethereum, for example, which is more suited for this purpose. We have multiple tokens for different protocols, and they have their own value. And the question is, if these tokens, um, like if they become so valuable that their total value overweights the value of the underlying asset, can this be a problem? Can it uh, incentivize or enable some complex attacks or double spans or whatever? I think this also applies to Lightning, probably to a lesser extent, because Lightning is much simpler and is not trying to be, I don't know, um, a token for the protocol that will, I don't know, save the planet or provide this and that. It's just kind of another way to transfer Bitcoins with another set of trade-offs. 
But if we imagine a future where, where most things happen on Lightning, I think there still would be a considerable number of transactions to happen on chain, yeah, at well, least well, opening well, most of well, channels. And uh, what I've read, that if you have such a mass proliferation of Lightning, Bitcoin's throughput limitation will be for opening and closing Lightning channels. <laughs> It'll all be used for that, and everything else will happen off chain. Well, submarine yeah. swaps. Yeah. So, what, what, would, be, what would be the incentive at that point to move and close the channels? To, to use this network. It's very yeah. popular. So then so what about funding an existing channel? Is well, there, at that point, you can do everything on Lightning. Mean, yeah, but why I, would you I, I, I mean, if, if Lightning is very, very successful, then many people who are not yet on Lightning have an incentive to join, yeah. and they will pay the on-chain fees to join the Lightning. And if, they, if the network is very useful, they will be willing to pay high fees to join this network mm -hmm. with an on-chain transaction. So, And you'll need to open a new channel when you run out of money in the channel. If I subscribe to some service provider and I do that for 10 years and then I'm out of yeah, money, I need a new channel to renew my subscription. Yeah. Some mean swaps are also off-chain, right? Uh, some of the swaps, as far as I understand, is kind of a way to um, use the same hash lock mechanism, but rather than use it between uh, two off-chain transactions, use it between an off-chain transaction and an on-chain transaction. So, as we can use a hash lock independently of Lightning, I can say, okay, I will... Um, so, in, in that scenario, Alice, Bob and Carol, Alice can say to Bob, I will pay you in Lightning Channel if you give me the secret that hashes this value. And then Bob can send to Carol, here's the on-chain transaction, yeah. which also is locked at the same hash value, and you can claim it on-chain if you know the secret. And I will just grab it from on-chain and claim it in Lightning Channel. So that will generate revenue for the miners anyway, just by rebalancing the channels in that way. Yeah, I, I think so, yeah, rebalancing yeah. Is, is tricky because, yeah. It works best when the flows are kind of balanced and you pay approximately the same amount that you receive. But yeah. the uh, kind of economic flows probably don't work that way. We mostly, like, our employer mostly pays us, uh, I think only pays us, <laughs> and we pay to different services. So yeah. Rebalancing is also a source of demand for on chain uh, stuff, on chain things. Can you fund the channel? Can I add? Yeah. Can I, because for now, closing yeah. and opening a new channel is two transactions, so it makes sense to be able to do one transaction to add funding to an existing channel rather than closing and opening a new one. Do you see? I think, I mean, in is the basic work? protocol, uh, this is, I mean, it's, it's not possible. You should yes. close and then open. Yeah. But we, we can think about, for example, if we are cooperative in this case, uh, nothing prevents us from closing this channel and Instead of these outputs, use it as, as, as this output. So create a new multi-signature. Based on that transaction? Based that on that, or somehow merge them. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm trying to invent it on, on, on the go. Yeah. But I mean, people are thinking about it, but it's not, like, and it's not obvious. Maybe I can combine, like, if we have two channels, and kind of weird situation, one channel is depleted here, the other channel is depleted there, we can close them and combine these outputs and from another channel to create some kind of new version channel. Something mm -hmm. like that. But again, it's kind of... Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so that can also be used across different blockchains. So what are kind of the conditions that two chains need to have in order to essentially be compatible? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, the, like, it depends on how abstract you want to be because if, if, you, if you take a, just the general idea of using hash locks, time locks, and uh, multi signatures, then basically any chain that uh, that has these primitives can be um, can be you can implement some kind of lightning project on that chain, including Ethereum, including basically everything. But if you want to be compatible with the concrete lightning specifications, then you have to you probably have to be very close to Bitcoin. I think they did a uh, Litecoin. Uh, Lightning, they have Litecoin Lightning, and they even did some cross chain um, transaction between Bitcoin and Litecoin, which uh, confirms this kind of joke that the primary purpose of Lite Litecoin is to be an example with Bitcoin atomic swaps blog posts. <laughs> yeah. But in that case, what are exactly the conditions? Are the same digital signature algorithm and the same hashing function? Or... I see no reason why I cannot do it with Ethereum, but I haven't 
heard about any concrete projects which would do that. But I can understand implementing lighting on a chain, but are you talking about lighting actually being a cross chain? Yes, yeah, exactly. So you exactly. open a channel on one yeah. chain and you pay to the other one? Exactly. So essentially doing atomic swaps between chains using lightning. But that would mean the atomic swap would happen in lightning. Well, in both, well, you could essentially close channels on both chains. Yeah. And it depends on what you mean by lightning. Well, lightning the protocol or lightning the Bitcoin lightning the lightning. The lightning. At least I can say well, that. Well, there would be one lightning network that would essentially be on top of it because essentially it's just like a separate peer to peer file yeah, to exchange yeah, those yeah. transactions. So you would exchange two transactions at the same time, maybe. That's the one that you could close on Lightning and uh, sorry, on, on Litecoin, and one that you could close on Bitcoin blockchain. But the exchange rates then become a really yeah. complicated yeah, yeah, factor on who's yeah. going to want to close <laughs> it and try to cheat and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, at least I can say that in Lightning, like if you launch Lightning node in the configuration file, you have like hash ID or hash uh, chain ID or chain identifier, uh, chain, ch chain hash, chain uh, yeah, chain ID. So I think you can swap it. I mean, obviously be between Bitcoin Man and Bitcoin Testnet, uh, but also Litecoin. I think if you just put the Lightning chain ID, then it will work. Sorry, with Litecoin chain ID, it will work. With like yeah, it's not. Just thinking back to the world map you showed us earlier, you showed all the channels. Um, those channels have been mapped by looking at the funding transactions only, right? So, um, so every funding transaction has an origin and a destination IP address somehow? No, okay. I think this is... Um, and okay, what actually happens here is that, first of all, Alice connects to Bob with a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Okay. And so then Alice can, like, Bob knows Alice's IP, Alice knows Bob's IP, and so on. Then Alice creates a transaction, like in the real life network, basically, theoretically, the channels can be dual funded, but in practice they are single funded. So Alice actually funds the channel, she creates um, a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain, and then she sends a message to Bob, hey Bob, I opened the channel, here's the hash of the transaction on the chain, you can go check. And um, yeah, and they also, by the way, they also prove to each other that they actually own the keys that are involved in this in this funding transaction to show that they actually can update the state. So as far as I understand, this map doesn't try to look in the Bitcoin blockchain. It, uh, looks well, right. I mean, there's no IP address in the transactions themselves, but it's at the networking layer. Yeah, yeah, it's not. So, so does that mean it would also be compatible with like Dandelion or some of these other privacy um, features? Mm, it's kind of tricky as well because Dandelion assumes that you should just broadcast your transaction no matter through which channels, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, here it's, it's different because um, for the routing part, if like, Alice wants to send coins to Bob, then what Alice does is that Alice has her own view of the network and she uses a classic uh, graph algorithm to find a path with some constraints and then she creates an onion routed, uh, like she packs the payment into layers of onion uh, encryption, which means that the payment must take a particular path chosen by the sender. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Dandelion, I just push the information to one of my neighbors, and I kind of don't care what happens then, which exact neighbor would forward it to which exact neighbor, I just want to, it to propagate to all the network. But here, we don't want to flood the network, rather we want, we want to forward the payment through a particular path. So it's, it's less private, I would say. I mean, it's, it's harder to maintain privacy when nodes and channels each have their own unique properties, and we want to choose them based on their properties, not just some nodes propagate something. Mm -hmm. But you need to predict the fees. Mm, yes. And you are yeah. able to do that because of that. Uh, so the fees works uh, work is well. Right? So actually, each intermediary node you need Latin fees. No, I mean like if you didn't know, if you don't know the pass, you cannot put extra money for the fees to be paid. Yeah, but I I kind of know the path because each node, when the node joins the network, mm -hmm. it propagates its fees through the gossip protocol and peer-to-peer layer. So each node internally has their view of the network, and Alice has some I mean, nodes and channels and fees. 
and then she launches a Dexter algorithm for pathfinding with certain constraints, and the algorithm says, okay, the optimal ways, the way that the optimal path that minimizes the fees is this path. And then um, if Alice wanted to send, if Alice wanted Bob to receive, say, 100 coins, and she knows that this node advertised a fee of two coins, and this node advertised a fee of one coin, she just sends 103 here, 103 here, this node forwards 102 here, and this node forwards 100 there. So Alice can predict what fees will be in the middle of the payment. Of course, these nodes can try to cheat and try to take more fees than they advertised, but then they risk that somewhere down the line the fees, the payment won't be sufficient and the payment will be cancelled, and if the payment is cancelled, then no one gets anything. So it's, the nodes are incentivized to actually take the fees that they advertise. And there's trust and performance. There's no metrics on that, though. Like, the node that takes two might be really fast, and the node that takes one might be a crappy node that falls down all the time. I might want to take a different path, because another path is more reliable. Um, I mean, like, again, the notion of what is more reliable depends on the reputation or identity. Yes. And in fact, the Lightning, in fact, has identity because the nodes have their permanent IDs. Yes. And of course, all the like, professionally maintained nodes, they have their, yeah, they advertise their addresses on their websites, and we know who are those people, more or less. So, um, yeah, probably the big nodes, if they advertise fire fees, people will still pay them because they're right. So there already exists a reputation system within I mean, uh, uh, the it's not kind of it's not called that way. It's not encoded in the protocol, but it exists. Uh, like in fact, because if you open, um, so okay, you I, can you can compute your soft reputation based. No, on it's, it's not like some uh, some um, number that you compute, but it's just the, the kind of the fact of life that there is. A, a small number of nodes which have a very high liquidity and lots of channels open yeah. and of course all other nodes are incentivized to connect to these big nodes because the probability of failure is smaller and because these nodes maintain essentially the same identifier both in the Lightning protocol and as their IP address because they advertise connect to my node at this IP address so that in fact the Lightning explorers, like blockchain explorers, but for Lightning, they show these nodes, they show their kind of human readable names, and essentially they develop a reputation. So we know that, like, Bitrefill, for example, is one of the companies working in the space, or um, like an anonymous entity under the name Alan Big, which maintains uh, dozens of very highly, um, highly funded channels. But from the information you see on the Bitcoin blockchain, so layer one, can you see also how the channels were closed? Whether it was the good, the bad, or the ugly? Uh, I think you can. I mean, um, because if yes, then you can compute the reputation of the node based on its historical behavior, right? Not necessarily. I mean, you can. Because you don't know which node in the chain was the bad actor yeah. when it's closed in an ugly way. You, you might have six nodes involved. And you don't know which one was the bad one necessarily. See? I thought channels are always just two parties, strictly. Well, it's Alice to Bob to Charlie, mm -hmm. for example. If, if you combine this multiple ah, payments, okay. then some, if some of them fails the payment, um, okay, then so it deck propagates. Yeah, yeah, deck propagates, and because it's all on routed, it's not even clear who exactly failed the payment. So I can be in the middle, someone sends a payment to me, I forward it further, and then an error comes to me, payment failed. And I, I don't know whether the next node failed it, or the next node, or the next node. But uh, regarding the question on the like, tracking on the Bitcoin blockchain, again, Lightning uh, protocol doesn't tag the Bitcoin transactions like this is Lightning transaction, of course. But you can establish some kind of structure, and um, mm, again, there was research on that, um, which tried to, like Christian Decker, one of the developers in the space, tried to estimate how many private channels are there in Lightning because you are not um, obliged to advertise your channels in the peer to peer network. You can just open a private channel and um, transact privately. Uh, and just based on the on chain footprint, he estimated the number of 
like the upper bound on the private shells because all the private shells must have been opened in this transaction structure. So if we calculate all transactions which look like this, like two of two multi then we can estimate how it will look like. But uh, yeah, if or when uh, Schnorr signatures are implemented in Bitcoin, then it will be uh, much uh, simpler because at least, as far as I understand, at least in this, in the cooperative case, these signatures can be aggregated and we won't even be able to tell whether it was a multi-seq or a single seq or whatever, lightning or just a simple transaction. Uh, but for now you can do some kind of analysis, but mm, not very precise. No question. If you want to interact on the lightning network and you want to fund the channel, uh, the actual funding is this an option transaction? Yeah, this is an on-chain transaction, so it starts from... Uh, so, yeah. so this, you know, I mean, assuming that, so do you have actually for all intents and purposes, your channel is in the address on a Lightning Network? Or is separate, yes. separate kind of Lightning Bitcoin address? Or? Uh, yeah, in fact, yeah, in, 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 it's a good question, and this in fact is correct, because inside the protocol, uh, channels have their unique identifiers okay. and there are actually two types of identifiers there's two ways to talk about the same thing one is cryptographic hash of something probably this transaction and another way of identifying channel is this notation which says something like uh, 100x3x0 uh, mm -hmm. which you read as follows the funding transaction was confirmed in block number 100 it's transaction number 3 in that block and this output is the output zero of that transaction. So to the, the question further, so the, uh, the funding, so the correlation between your channel and your actual Bitcoin address on chain is an open transaction. There is no uh, layer of uh, uh, it's an anonymity here. Yes, uh, what, I mean, what is that possibility to have like an anonymous? I mean, if you don't want to like show the source of your funding. Because that's saying you use your lightning network for microtransactions and you don't necessarily want you want to like you don't want to directly associate it to your to your on chain wallets. Yeah. I, that's a layer of, uh, I mean that, that, that's 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 a fair fair question, but I think it's just two different kind of mm, two orthogonal questions. Lightning for like scalability and fast payments, yeah. but it's not for I mean if you want your coins to not be associated with Lightning, you should mix them before you put them into Lightning. Okay. And the kind of the privacy benefit of Lightning compared to on-chain is that everything that happens within the channel is not being broadcast to the to the world. But initially, if you want to be private, like on this step from on-chain to off-chain, then you have to do some additional measures on-chain. So you would go from from the main wallet and then just fund the Lightning. I mean, yeah, it depends on your security model. If you want to, uh, if you don't care, you can. If you want to protect yourself in terms of privacy, you can mix it. You can uh, do some other kinds of swaps or something. Okay. I have a question that is more practical. So um, right now there are already like some apps that allow you to use a Lightning network. Uh, so you find your channel, so you find your balance on, on the Lightning network. But you don't. You're not really given like a private uh, or a seed or a private key of your balance. That's called balance on the line. Network. So what happens if for some reason you lose your phone and uh, and don't have access to the app anymore? Because on, on layer one you still have your seed. You get another computer, another com phone. And see them you still have your comments. Yeah, yeah. Also a very good question. And again, I didn't look into this area that that deep, but at least what I understand is that backups in Lightning are harder than in Bitcoin. Yeah. On, on chain it's just enough to write down these words and then you can derive all the future address and it's just enough to keep it safe somewhere. But in Lightning actually because the protocol is interactive, um, at this point you don't know the future states of all the channels and therefore you cannot back them up. So ideally you should back up your state uh, after every channel, yeah. mm -hmm. which is somehow not how backups usually work. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't know, I mean, you can either, uh, like some wallets provide some automated uh, kind of 
encrypted backups that actually do backup you after every transaction and put some kind of encrypted blob onto Google Drive or Dropbox or something, which is a kind of a compromise, but it kind of works. Alternatively, you can just say, I don't care for the small amounts. But yes, if you, if you lose your phone, mm -hmm. then... Um, yeah, I think if, if you try to back up some kind of digital media state, then you lose your phone, and then you try to uh, re instantiate these channels. I'm trying to understand is it the same as trying to cheat or not? But I can't understand mm -hmm. readily. It could be. It could be. Yeah. Because if, if Bob loses his phone, Alice can simply revert. Re re if Bob loses his phone mm -hmm. yeah. after he gave Alice a bicycle mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, I, I think I heard this kind of this this notion, this problem that um, if for some reason due to some mistake in your software you try to restore from backup and it's an old backup, the network can think that you are cheat, cheating and your counterparty will punish you uh, though you didn't actually try to steal any money. So it's kind of complicated. No more questions. Okay, well, yes, if there are any other questions, it's not okay, then um, you should take it up with him after the session. Have a yeah. good drink, but I'd like to take the opportunity to say thank you very much. Thank you.